My name is Hans Kandel. I'm an extension agronomist at NDSU. North Dakota farmers have been growing traditionally a lot of spring wheat. At the end of the season in August or beginning of September, many of the growers decide to work the fields because we don't know what the conditions will be in the following year. And black soil tends to warm up faster than when there is a stubble. In the past, horses were used to work the ground, uh, to work the wheat stubble. Uh, nowadays, of course, we have uh, big equipment and uh, traditionally it can be blackened very quickly. In this particular field, we have worked the ground substantially. However, we would prefer to think about more a live cover and increasing the soil capacity, the soil health. So today we're going to talk about cover crops after wheat. Instead of having black ground, we want to mimic nature more. And in this particular example, we have had uh, the spring wheat harvested. Some of the seeds came out of the combine and we have here a situation of volunteer spring wheat. As you can see, we have a green cover. This is an experimental site and previously I had spring wheat on small plots, but I had also alleyways where we did not have any crop. And we can see the color difference in these two areas. Where I'm standing, it is fairly light green. Where the alleys were, we see a dark green because there is more nitrogen. So the plant can take up some of the nitrogen that is still in the soil and capture it instead of having some of that nitrogen leaching away. A live crop is very important for soil health because we have a living root system we have the crop growing and it is now able to add some more organic matter. Also for soil erosion control, this field will have very limited soil erosion compared to a black soil. Today we're talking about cover crops. We saw that we can have a crop growing just as the volunteer spring wheat. But in this case we also planted some uh, different cover crops into the stubble. We used a planter that was able to plant right into the stubble and we chose a number of different legumes as well as broadleaf crops. We are looking here at the legume because legumes tend to be able to fix some extra nitrogen. Field pea is one of the legumes that has a great ability to fix biologically nitrogen. So in the particular plot that we are looking at here, we see the legume, the pea, also surrounded by the volunteer spring wheat. So here we make use of the natural uh, re residual seed that came out of the combine for the wheat and we just planted in this case field peas. Another group of plants that we are testing are the brassicas. Brassicas have uh, the tendency to grow really well into the late season the cool season crops and we have here some radishes. The radishes again here are planted into the stubble of the wheat and we see a mixture of radish and the spring wheat. This is about a month after planting. Radishes in this case have the ability to make a deep tap root and loosen the ground. And just for just a month's growth, we already see a nice little taproot starting to develop. We still have some time on the clock and this root will only grow bigger. So before the season really ends, this plant will still be maybe twice as big as it is now. Brassicas can grow late into the season, but there are two types of brassicas. Those that can survive the winter and those that cannot. Here is one of the types that can survive the winter, which is winter camelina. In this case, we planted the winter camelina into the wheat stubble and we see a combination of the spring wheat and the camelina. In this case, the camelina is relatively small, but it will survive the winter and will start to regrow. All the small grain is spring wheat and will die off. So we will have a cover next spring. The plants are relatively small at this time 
and they stay what we call in the rosette stage. Another cool season brassica is canola. Canola can also grow late into the season. This particular canola is a Roundup Ready canola. The reason why I selected Roundup Ready is that would give you an option to spray this field and eliminate the spring wheat if you desire to do so. But I was also interested in seeing the competition between the canola and the spring wheat. And you can see where the canola is growing. It grows nicely and it is developing still late into the season and it will continue growing till we get a frost. But it will not survive the winter. In this plot we see that cowpea. Cowpea is a legume but it is also a warm season crop. It typically is seeded if you plant early in the summer but there is a big risk if you plant late into the fall. This year we had an early frost in the first week of September and the cowpea which is very sensitive to cold temperature froze. So it is not recommended to use a warm season crop in your mixture when you plant at the end of the season. Another legume we tried is the warm season crop soybean. Soybean also is not very uh, suitable in cool conditions. With the frost the plants nearly died all of them but a few remained and tried to struggle to life but it will not amount to much. Therefore we should not grow the warm season soybeans into this system planting it late in the fall. A common winter annual is winter rye. In this case we planted the winter rye and we have the volunteer spring wheat. The winter rye is established right now and it will survive the winter whereas the winter wheat will die. So next spring the rye will continue its growth and will cover the ground throughout the season. So in this case we have a mixture of two grasses, the spring wheat and the rye. We have looked at uh, several of the cover crops, how they grow in the fall. Some of those overwinter and now we are looking at the second year, looking at growing soybeans on top of the cover crops. So in the area where we are standing, we had cover crops as I showed you previously. In this region, we planted the uh, soybeans on top of some of the residue, but also in some of the live cover, the camelina, and the rye and we planted some spring oats. The objective of this part is to see what is the effect of the cover crop from one year to the next crop, the soybeans, in the second year. So we have seen where soybeans are grown into a standing cover crop, the rye or the camelina. In this case I want to show you how you can use a cover crop at the end of the season. Behind me is a plot of soybeans and in those soybeans, in the rows, as soon as the lower leaves of the soybean starts to turn yellow, we can put in some rye or camelina. And the rye or the camelina can grow in the canopy. And then once the soybeans are harvested, there is ample light for the rye to continue growing late into the season. And it will survive through the winter. And now we have a cover in the winter and it will start growing into the spring and we can grow another crop into either the rye or the camelina. In summary, cover crops can be utilized in the fall, go into the winter and cover the soil. We can have some growth in the spring depending on the species. The benefits are to cover the ground, to take up some residual nitrogen, and in certain cases add some extra nitrogen if we use a legume. Do not use the warm season crops into the late fall, but warm season can be used early in the season in June, July, August. There are many op options for cover crops and it depends on your uh, intent of the cover crop, which species you should select. In the second half of this presentation I'm going to talk a little bit more about the opportunities and about some of the research findings. First of all, talking about the opportunities. On this graph we see the hours of day length in Fargo, North Dakota, 
On the bottom, we have the month of the year. On the right, you see the hour of the day, starting from a, a, 1 a.m. in the morning all the way to 11 o'clock at night. And for instance, in the middle of the summer, the longest day, this is the yellow is the day length available for the plants with uh, on the top some dusk and on the bottom some dawn. So this is the amount of sunlight in midsummer. So if we are thinking about a normal crop uh, production system, we start planting, like say, the small grain, probably somewhere end of April, beginning of May. And then hopefully we can harvest uh, the small grain somewhere in August. Now the graph here, of course, uh, shows a little bit of a funny uh, uh, break on the left and the right. That has to do with the day length saving time. So we're concentrating really on the yellow part in this graph. So in August we harvest uh, our small grains roughly and then we have a period that uh, is frost free. So the end of the growing season is maybe taking place somewhere in October. So in that period after the small grain or even after canola or field pea we have an opportunity to grow a cover crop. After the frost we typically see that the plants are going dormant. So during the last part of the uh, the season into uh, November, December, we have a dormant crop. And then when we look at the spring coming up, we have first dormant in the winter. And then maybe by March or April, when the temperatures warm up enough, it breaks dormancy if it is a winter annual and the crop starts to regrow. Of course, all the annuals will have died during the winter. But then when we are looking at uh, March, when the temperature starts to rise, the dormancy is broken, we have some additional growth of the cover crop. So that's the second opportunity. So we typically have a time in the fall and a time in the spring that we can utilize some of the sunlight. And then probably um, somewhere in May, we start to grow the main crop again after the cover crop that can be maybe soybeans. So this is kind of the two main opportunities that I'm gonna talk about today. So we talked about cover crops, we have already uh, encountered uh, several of them, but basically what is important to know is that we uh, are trying to uh, establish the main reasons why we go a cover crop. And mostly that could be preventing erosion, or it could be improving the soil, uh, it could also to try to enhance the crop productivity long term, that is what we are aiming at, to add more biological life, to add more nutrition to uh, the soil that is recycled and therefore cover crops have many opportunities long term. So here's a picture where, which I took uh, after intercropping into uh, sunflower. So although there is also opportunities for uh, crop, crop cover crops in other sections of the cropping system, I'm going to focus today basically on spring wheat or anyway wheat followed by cover crops as well as planting cover crops into standing soybean. So as an ideal cover crop we really need to uh, look at inexpensive seed. It shouldn't cost us too much. It should be easy to establish and then of course we need to have a plant that rapidly grows and that we can have a cover quickly in the fall. Low maintenance, should be easy to kill. So for instance, most of the annuals winter kill, so that would be an easy way to, to kill the crop. And it should not interfere with the following crop. So the challenge really is where do we fit it in? And I've already kind of indicated that there are for uh, the crops that are growing early in the season, small grains, canola, field pea, we have this opportunity after the main crop. So Basically, we need to find a system that is adapted to your area and we should kind of balance those short-term economics with the long-term benefits that uh, we have to have some expenditure, buying seed, planting the cover crop, but the long-term benefits uh, are into additional carbon and crop uh, protection, uh, soil erosion protection, and therefore we are looking at it as a system. Now I've been showing you some video of uh, cover crops in the eastern part of uh, the state, but I just wanted to make sure that uh, this system can also work in some of the western parts of the state. In this case, 
seeding took place when the hardware spring wheat was heading out and uh, some of the seed was broadcast over the top of the growing crop. The next picture is a system where it was planted after the harvest. So typically farmers uh, can use the cover crops, as I mentioned, for various purposes. And one of the purposes could be grazing. And again, this is a picture from Western North Dakota to indicate that it is possible. However, any system needs to have moisture available for the crop germination. I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the tools that I've been using. I use my cell phone with an app called Canopio. And that Canopio uh, is an, a, a system to kind of estimate the cover, the ground cover of uh, various crops. It can be cover crops, can be also regular field crops that we use. Now on the left picture, you see a small grain crop and you see there is green matter growing there, but in between you see also some soil and other particles. So what this canopy does, it translates every green pixel into white and everything else into black. And then it counts all those pixels and makes a ratio how many pixels are green and how many are not green so that you get a percent. So in this case, in this picture, it was 37% of that picture is green cover. Now I'm using it just kind of to give an idea of how much cover we have in uh, our plots. So I'm going to explain a little bit of some of the results that we have seen of the video that you saw in the beginning of this presentation. Now I've taken these numbers on the on 30th of September and the reason was that you know on average long term our frost is taking place somewhere at the end of September, beginning of October. So I'm just trying to give you a realistic number of what you can get. Now, in this particular year, the growth extended after the first frost early September, but the growing season continued all the way in October. So, so I could also have gone into October and given you higher numbers. But this is just a snapshot of what is potential for cover crops. So this was planted after spring wheat, canola, soybeans, pea, etc. as I showed in the, in the video. Now in this case we look here at the, at the number 89% of the field was covered by the canola, the soybean plots at 52%. Now I, I showed you in the video that the soybean plants warm season crop and also the cowpea warm season crop died when we had a frost taking place in the beginning of September. That is why it is not advisable. However in the system that I utilized here is the volunteer wheat including now a cover crop shows that we still have a cover and that's covered the 50 percent is basically the spring wheat cover p very aggressive grower nitrogen fixer very well cover in this uh, graph you can see it is 92 percent cover and then rye which is a slower grower in the fall here we have a combination of rye and spring wheat and we saw that there was 76 percent cover great cover now the next slide is kind of looking at the above ground biomass. So basically I harvested the whole crop, just cutting it above the, the surface level, dried it in, in uh, our uh, dryers, and then weighed it. So this is dry weight. So this is pounds per acre. And if you look here, pounds per acre of the canola was 11, six, uh, 30, 63 pounds so that is a, a good number of pounds that was the highest number of pounds for biomass so what i did is i harvested both the cover crop and the wheat so combined is the right column what was 1284 pounds so again that is the highest number so that is the combination between the canola and the wheat so when we look at the next one of course i showed some of the uh, the small dyed plants. So there is still a little bit of cover there, but very limited. And the remaining cover is basically the spring wheat. So as the spring wheat initially was growing together with the, with the soybean, there was not as much as there could have been without the crop. So here we still benefit from having a cover and there was 185 pounds of uh, biomass produced. Now P, uh, it has a very nice biomass, as you could uh, see in some of the videos that I showed you. Uh, here, total peas and wheat, 1,161 pounds. Rye, the last one, 
has limited growth in the fall, but still together with the spring wheat, it had still 760 pounds of dry matter in, uh, in the fall. So there is always a relationship between the amount of cover that you can see and the amount of pound produced. So here on the bottom, you see the cover percent that I took with the Canopio reading. And then on the left, you see the pounds of dry matter that are actually produced. So you see there's a nice relationship so that we can kind of express that more cover also indeed resulted in higher levels. So the next couple of pictures, I'm going to show you a couple of winter rye. So coming now out of the dormancy in the spring, there will be an uh, amount of dry matter production. So here I'm showing several pictures uh, kind of in different locations just to show you kind of what, what biomass you can have. So this one, Morris, uh, on 6th of May, and not too much yet. Lamberton, 153 pounds. But if you can see in St. Paul, where it was warmer, it had been uh, better growing conditions, that crop takes off and there you already see a 2,000 pound crop. In Roseau, in May, there was also good uh, growing conditions and we had 800 pounds. So now the question is, when do you terminate this crop in order to grow the main crop? But what I was trying to see is the first, I showed you numbers from the fall. Here are a few numbers from the spring growth. A lot of growers are utilizing uh, this system to plant uh, soybeans into, and this is a green planting system. So the growers used the rye, planted into the rye, and then as the rye was heading out, they terminated it with a roller crimper. Uh, some other experiments are taking place by trying to grow dry beans into residue, and so this can also be an effective uh, uh, system to do. So the thing about growing a crop in the spring is we need to monitor the moisture in a drier uh, spring. We may need to ter terminate the cover crops a little bit earlier. Now, what about soybeans? We've done some experiment also with, uh, with soybeans. And uh, here's an example of how uh, we use uh, an, uh, a planter to plant the seed right into the soybeans. And if you look here at the right picture, you can see the soybean was still very limited. So the idea was early in the season, you can get in. Um, maybe you can get into the crop uh, with your planting equipment, depending on your row spacing till the plants are a little bit taller, but at a certain point you cannot go into the plot anymore without doing damage. So the same field here we see on the left picture, the soybean already has some pods, and now we see the camelina growing underneath the crop. So one of the trials I did was to use winter camelina, 5.3 pounds, cereal rye, and I planted it into standing soybeans with had maturities of 04, 05, 08, and 09. And I did it at the R7 stage of the earliest maturing soybean. Here are a couple of pictures of what it might look like. So in the season, September, we see the, the soybean is still standing. The picture on the right, October, the soybean is harvested. Here we compare on the left camelina in October with rye. Here we're comparing in the spring what camelina looks like, it starts just to come out of the dormancy, starts to grow. And here kind of the picture of rye in the fall and in the spring. So you can see in the spring uh, quite a bit of growth occurring. So what kind of numbers did we see? Well, we saw in camelina, uh, the total over, and that is in the spring, about 250 pounds and rye, we saw about 500 pounds. So definitely rye has more biomass production in the spring compared with uh, the camelina. Then I would like to finish up here with showing you that um, the biomass in the spring in the different maturities differed. And you can look here at the uh, last column, the combined, there was more biomass in what was previously the early maturing soybean because we had more light there for the cover crop to grow. However, we also need to kind of look at the economics. And here I'm looking at the yield of the previous year, that is the soybean yield. When we interseeded the cover crops, we did not have any negative effect on the yield, but we can see that the early maturing 
definitely was not yielding as much as the late maturing. So in summary, you should not really uh, select an early maturing variety to benefit a little bit on the biomass produced, but you should really look at the full season and then maybe add some biomass. So in summary, I would say that uh, we have a lot of opportunity to, uh, to grow uh, several cover crops and uh, I'm uh, looking to continue with uh, some of the research and I'm always happy to uh, answer any of your questions. Mm -hmm.